We are going to get into uh, this morning's message. Um, so if you have your Bibles or the Pew Bible in front of you, uh, op- dial open back up um, to Luke chapter 10 um, with me this morning. And, and we're going to do um, a study on Mary and Martha, and it's actually going to be two parts. Um, and so hopefully you will come back next week uh, for part two of what we're going to talk about um, and. Part of this is for your benefit. Uh, I've preached the, this sermon um, on Mary and Martha twice, I guess, in the last couple of months, um, in different forms to different audiences. Uh, but I've preached this passage in Luke chapter uh, 10, and then if you are familiar with the John chapter 11 passage, um, which is Jesus raising Lazarus out of the grave, that is that is that will be part two um, of specifically Mary and Martha in that passage. Um, so for your benefit. I've split that into two sermons um, because the both times that I've had that, I have had um, more than enough time. Uh, but for this morning, I'm um, with Luke chapter 10. We're going to look at what does it look like to protect our proximity to Jesus at home right, when we're not in church. What does it look like for us to just sit at the feet of Jesus in our own homes? Um, And next week is going to look at what does it look like to pursue our proximity with Jesus when we're out and about. Uh, Because the reality of it is we're not always in church and we're most certainly not always at home. We have jobs to go to, responsibilities to take care of. Uh, What does it look like to stay close to Jesus in those moments? Uh, But as for this morning, um, we're going to look through... Martha specifically, and then Mary, um, and then what do we learn from those? Um, and then the last kind of, I will wrap this up this morning uh, with, after my first week, um, what do I hope that defines the church here um, at Bethlehem Stone Pile? Um, can you all put the slides on the screen? There we go. Thank you. So as we, we read this, this passage, uh, one of the first details that we get this is this very notion that Jesus shows up to the house of Mary and Martha. Mary listens, and we're told that Martha was distracted. To start understanding this, this passage, this, this point here, um, that Satan lives in distraction is key. As I've read this and kind of thought about this point, and this actually is the one point that has not changed in the three different times I've given this sermon. Um, This has always been the first point, and I think quite possibly one of the most important points. Because if we really think about it, uh, Jesus tells us that that the demons and even will bow down to, to Jesus. James writes that even the evil forces and the demons of the world know the power of Jesus. That being said, Satan cannot ask us or force us to do something that he cannot do himself. Okay, and so Satan's not going to kind of push us to forgetting or to like denying the name of Jesus because he himself knows the power of the name of Christ. And so the solution to that is if we can just simply forget. Right? How many times do we just we go through our weeks, through our lives, through our days, we never say God is bad. We never say we're going to leave the church. We never say we're not going to do that. We just simply forget. And it's for Mary here, or for Martha, that Satan lives in the distraction of, well, what am I doing? Because Jesus is quite literally sitting in her house. Hopefully you do not forget your guests are in your house when you let them in. But but that's exactly what happens here. Uh, If you are familiar with C.S. Lewis, um, I think is one of the greatest minds to ever walk the earth. Um, Once was an atheist turned Christian, has written countless amount of books um, that are far above my head at times. But one of my, my favorite books that he's ever written is called The Screwtape Letters. Um, and so he's actually so smart, he writes this entire book about Christian life from the perspective of the devil. It took me like three or four reads to even understand what was happening. 
But one of the key points the whole way throughout the book is about the human life of like Satan going, if I can just get humanity to turn on themselves, they'll simply self-implode. We sit in our lives and we're like, yeah, that's pretty true. But if we can just, if he can just get us to kind of forget about the reality and presence of God, our faith itself will just implode on itself. Do you see the, the second verse there in 1 Kings um, chapter 3? This is part of the prayer of Solomon. And so we're, you probably know that when God says Solomon, ask for anything and I'll give it to you, and we're told that Solomon asks for wisdom. You probably say that does not look like wisdom, and that's certainly not English. It's not. <laughs> What Solomon asks for is he asks for a lave shomea. It's, it's Hebrew. Um, that's what is often translated later to wisdom. Uh, but it actually quite literally translates to a listening heart. And so biblical wisdom, and what we're talking about, is a listening heart. And so the difference through all of this is Mary takes the posture of a listening heart while Martha takes the position of running around with her head cut off. Secondly, we think we owe Jesus something in what we do. Because Martha entered or allowed Jesus in, Jesus and the disciples in, and so it would be common courtesy to feed them something, to be of some sort of host. Given the time and, and how this normally worked, uh, most commentaries will tell you a light snack would have done. But we're told with this translation that Martha's too distracted preparing a, a big dinner. I cannot read this passage without thinking of just like Thanksgiving dinners. And some of y'all have been there where you're preparing this meal, um, and it doesn't matter who comes into your house as long as they stay out of your way. Or you're on the other side of, you know whose way to stay out of. Because Jesus actually says to her, right, Martha, you're worried and upset over all the details. Of what kind of feast can we throw for Jesus? Like if Jesus is coming, we owe him as much as we can give in this food. Yes. But Jesus tells this, and the way we see through Jesus responding is, the lesson from this is we have to sit with Jesus first. And what happens is I think this is the posture that Martha takes, and I think it's oftentimes the posture that we take, is we just go, well, Jesus is close enough. I mean, I let him in my house and he's sitting in the living room. Right? He's simply close enough. And what happens is those rooms and the distance between those rooms starts to grow. Right? If you think about, if you're a parent with kids when you're in one room and your kids are in another, that distance starts to grow. Right? If you and your spouse are sitting in different rooms, for better or for worse, right, that, that starts to grow in a relationship and distance starts to become more evident. And the last part of this passage is kind of where we see Martha turn on Mary. Of, well, doesn't it just seem unfair? Like, I gotta do all of this work and she just sits on the couch. This is what happens when we take this, this posture of Jesus is close enough. Well, I'm close enough to Jesus. We may be in different rooms, but at least, hey, we're kind of in the same house. Martha, this conversation that she has of doesn't it seem unfair that, that I'm doing all of the work and I'm, I'm the one serving and she's just the one sitting. Oftentimes it's very easy for, I think, the human nature to attack worship that's not like ours. Martha actually deems what Mary is doing and sitting at the feet of Jesus to be inferior to her activity. And we end up turning on each other we break all sort of unity because siblings fight, right? But how do we get over this, this notion that Jesus is just close enough? 
because Mary did it, and that's what we we see a lot, I think, about Mary throughout this entire passage and just her current heart posture. Um, and the first point is she's just ready, like for the opportunity to sit with Jesus. When I grew up playing sports, I still coach. Like if we wait until game day to do anything, we're not going to be very successful. Uh, one of our coaches is a police officer and he talks to our kids all the time, like in the police academy, they train you for life and death situation and if you wait until you're in a life or death situation to figure out what you're going to do, you're going to die. In a spiritual sense, if we wait and sit until we're in the face of temptation to figure out how we're going to handle temptation, we're going to fall short. And to take it one step further here, if we wait and we're not ready for when Jesus shows up, the end result will be not great. I, I, I make this point because we're told that Jesus and the disciples are traveling to a certain village. Martha opens the door, and the first detail we get about anything is that Mary goes and sits at the feet of Jesus. She didn't know Jesus was going to show up at their house then and there. But it was this heart posture of, when I get in the presence of God, I'm going to be ready. I'm going to be ready to worship. I'm going to be ready to simply learn because the posture of a follower of Christ goes back to Solomon. It is a listening heart. This is one of the really cool parts of this passage, I think. In how this is handled is Jesus actually acknowledges Mary as a disciple. So the word that we get, disciple, um, Jesus kind of lays the groundworks a lot of times for what is a disciple. Uh, you see the verse there in John chapter 8, right? If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple. Right? This idea of a listening heart is what characterizes a disciple. The Greek word um, is mathetes. And so what a disciple quite literally translates to um, is being a pupil, a follower, a learner, a student. So young Jewish boys would kind of pursue the feet of the rabbi. That meaning like they were with the rabbi wherever they could go to simply just sit, watch, and learn. It's where we get this notion of being a disciple. At this time, women were not really regarded as students. Um, they would not necessarily be the first choice or most present um, kind of demographic to study in the temple. So Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning, is unorthodox culturally. This idea of even us, I think, sitting at the feet of Jesus in 2023 is going to be culturally unorthodox. But what happens? Because here's the reason that many rabbis did not disciple or teach young women or women at all is because it, at this time women were seen as less um, they were, were constrained to the house and so a rabbi would be quote lowering himself to teach a woman but what we see here is Mary sits at the feet of Jesus and Jesus sits down and teaches her this is the acknowledgement of Mary as a disciple, and Jesus quite literally lowers himself, per cultural standards, to teach you. The very incarnation of Jesus is that. is God lowering himself to be with us here on earth to teach us. Is are we ready for the opportunity? This is the key point of, of Mary. She chooses presence with God over practice of God. The, every translation you read if you're of English will give you Martha was distracted by something. Um, some will say the meal, some will say the big dinner, others will say her service. The Greek literally translates to much serving. She was distracted from the presence of God by doing. 
so it, it begs this question of, when we look at Mary and Martha, are we going to be a proper host or a proper disciple? And that's kind of one we have to figure out. Or am I going to do all the church things, or am I actually going to be a part of the church? Am I going to be defined by serving, or am I just going to sit in the presence of God and go from there? But because sitting at the presence of God, learning from Jesus, is the, the one thing that cannot be taken away. That is why it's the one question that, that we have to answer. But if, will you follow Jesus is the one question in life that, that really reigns true and matters from the time we are born until the time that we leave the earth. As the children were up here, some of you may have young teenagers or kids, into where Sarah and I are in our, in our 20s, to then you have kids. Like The questions and the matters of life change the entire time. Right, things that matter to an eight-year-old don't matter to you. Things that matter to me now, you're like, just wait till they don't matter anymore. The questions and, and priorities of life are always changing. But will you follow Jesus is the one question that matters from day one till your final day. That's why Jesus ends the passage with the words of, Mary has discovered it. She has chosen the better path. Some translations will tell you she has chosen the better meal. And it will not be taken away from her. What does this mean for the church, the body of Christ? First, we have to come to terms that you can serve without Jesus. That is the truth of the matter. It does not take Jesus to serve. I mean, I think about this often of nobody's opening the door for me going, in the name of Jesus, I open the door for you. I went grocery shopping at Aldi yesterday and a lady gave me a cart. It wasn't like, in the name of Jesus, I bless you and here's my shopping cart. We can serve, we can even serve Jesus without the spirit of Jesus. That's what we learn from Martha. In Matthew chapter 7 here, some will argue this is one of the scariest set of verses in Scripture. Right on Judgment Day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we have prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I, Jesus, will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. We can do all of these things without Jesus. That is why the presence and the time that you sit and learn from Christ is the only thing you need to be concerned about. If you take care of that, the serving will take care of itself. But you can do the serving and it will mean nothing in the end if separated from Jesus' name. But I think it's, it's very interesting uh, one of the things that fascinates me the most is authorship of scripture um, and just how some things are written in order. And so depending where this passage falls in the Bible, mine's at the very beginning of a page. So if I flip back, the passage right before this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. In quite literally, I think the, one of the best biblical examples of what it means to serve without Jesus. Right? Because we have the priest... You have a temple assistant walk by the Samaritan on the side of the road who could be dead, he's alive hardly, and needs help. We're told both of them, the priest and the temple assistant, the religious people, cross to the other side of the road because they would defile themselves by touching him. If he was dead, it would dirty their hands. Listen, by the religious law, they did the right thing. But they, white, they were serving without the presence, the spirit, and the compassion of Christ. That's why the Good Samaritan shows up. Crosses all the boundaries of defilement, all the separations to serve and care for the man along the side of the road. I think too often we're, we're actually not concerned about serving Jesus. 
but we want to keep our hands clean much like the people in the passage of the Good Samaritan. We want to keep our resume clean before God. And what ends up happening is we do so much work for the Lord that the Lord actually loses our attention. Like Martha's running around making this dinner, forgetting the fact that Jesus is actually sitting in the other room. And we forego that opportunity to do that. Right? So the church, we have to be in tune with this fact of if we don't pay attention, if we don't protect the proximity to Jesus, we can serve, even in the name of Jesus, without the presence and spirit of Jesus. Point number two, you don't need a clean house to open the door. I will actually love the fact that we don't get this detail. Listen, here's the reality of it. We can even know we're having a guest, and especially when we don't know we're having a guest. And someone, you hear that knock on the door, it's a little 360 spin to see everything that needs to clean up and how fast can you get it organized before you can open the door. You may even yell out, give me a minute. We always feel this need of like, somehow being a good host is a clean house. But we're just not told that Jesus shows up and Martha opens the door. There's an incredible video um, that I've seen many times on the internet. It's, it's of a youth and a, and a pastor uh, out on the streets of a, of a city, and he, he's talking like this kid's just so curious about Christ. and. Uh, he, asks, he asks the pastor, he goes, do I need to stop smoking pot to follow Christ? And the pastor goes, no. <laughs> and they, then the kid in typical response goes, I, you're a little older than I am, I don't think you understand. He goes, do I need to stop smoking drugs to follow Jesus? And the pastor looks at him and goes, no. He goes, do you need to take a shower, or do you need to be clean before you go take a shower? He goes, I'll make a deal with you. You just open the door to Jesus, and we'll let him take care of the rest. You don't need to clean the house to open the door to Jesus. I promise you, we'll make a deal. If there's something that needs clean, he'll clean it. He'll take care of it. That's why we get these words in Matthew chapter 11 of, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Right, we are weary, we are carrying things, we are distracted. We're trying to just pull it together and give Jesus a feast so maybe he really actually doesn't see how messy the kitchen is. But if we just sit at the feet of Jesus and open the door, we have the chance to experience the power of Christ. That's why I think if we really continue studying Mary and Martha, when we get to John chapter 11 next week, like that's the power of that passage if you really study Mary and Martha. Is they open the door and then they follow and it ends up, they watch Jesus resurrect their brother out of the grave. And at that point, who cares how clean the house was? They walked with Jesus and experienced a miracle. You don't need a clean house to open the door. If I can give you any encouragement, bring what you know and learn from there. So often I think we, we get wrapped up in the excuse of, well, I don't really know anything about Jesus. I don't really know anything about the Bible. And in just the cultural process of what we don't know, we just dismiss. Well, if I don't know anything about the Bible, that's my reason to not read the Bible. If I don't know that much about Jesus, that's my reason to not go to church. I will encourage you, all that Mary knew at this point in time was it was Jesus and the disciples and Jesus claimed to be God. That's what she knew. And she goes, I'm going to sit and I'm just going to learn in case that is true. The passage you see on the screen is Matthew chapter 16. And Jesus asked the disciples, well, who do people say I am? And they give them a whole lot of answers. John the Baptist, Elijah, some of the other prophets. I mean, Jesus looks Peter, I think, dead in the eye and says, who do you say I am? Right? And Peter replies, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. If that's all you know, start from there. 
and just move forward to Jesus and learn. He will teach you what you need to know about himself from there. We see that with Peter. That's what Peter knew. All Peter knows is this guy showed up, said, I'll teach you to be a fisher of men. Follow me. Peter said, okay. We get this. Who do you say I am? You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's all Peter really knows. And what happens is Peter ends up being the one who leads the church. Bring what you know of Jesus and just sit and learn from there. That, I think, is what we just learn about Mary and Martha. And what we are called to do is we have to win at home before we're going to win anywhere else. If you like sports metaphors, that's why it's so much harder to win on the road, the away games. Right? You're supposed to win the games at home because there's a comfort level. Mary wins at home. But even in my house, I'm just going to sit where Jesus is. Two sub points for you. God, bring your Bible to the house of God and then leave it open in your house. Two separate points here. In a 2023 post-resurrected, Jesus has ascended. We're waiting for him to come back. The Bible is how we learn of who Jesus is. The Bible is the revelation of God that teaches us about God. If all you actually know is that God is in the Bible, learn from there and I encourage you to bring your Bible to church. Bring your own Bible to church. The hardest thing of sitting at home, I think, is often just to open the cover of the Bible. There is a part of us that just... Because it's fine once we open it. Once we open it, we're good, and we can do it, and we're in it, and the Lord speaks to us, and we're super encouraged. But it's just, can we open it? Which is, um, I'll get to the second point and come back to the first. If I can encourage you to do anything just to help with that, just leave your Bible open. Just don't close it. But this is something that, that Sarah and I did. Is if you just read the Bible, just leave it open. And I think you will be surprised as to how many times you just walk past it and read it again. Even if it's one verse at a time, or if you're like me, you just see boxes and words. It takes away the daunting nature of having to just open the cover. If it's already open, you're much more likely to read it. Open it once. You can take it home and just open it right away. And just leave it open. And then if you walk past it, even if you just read one verse. Right, ours was on our kitchen table. And so you were walking past it all. And you're just reminded of what you read. And it makes it so less daunting to just sit down at the feet of Jesus and just learn. Right? And why do I encourage you to bring your Bible? There is some part of our, like, some psychological part of our brain that just makes us more comfortable with, like, our Bible. And I think the other reason it's so hard to read the Bible at home sometimes is because it, we know it takes a lot of courage for some of us to just open the cover, but like we're just not comfortable in reading our own Bible because the only time that we really interact with it is trying to overcome this huge fear of just opening the Bible. If you're willing to just bring your Bible to church, you will become more comfortable with your own Bible, and if you read it here, it's going to be a lot easier for you to read it at home. One of my good friends is a psychology teacher at Dallas Town, and he told me that there's science that, that this is true, that I wasn't crazy, and I just took his word for it because I don't know psychology. <laughs> but these two things, if you just bring your Bible to church and just leave it open, we are removing some of the most key psychological barriers as to like what keeps us from interacting with Jesus. All right, so I encourage you over the next week, at least, commit yourself the week until we come back next Sunday, and just try these two things. And see what happens. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 1. 
because it talks about the blessed and the wicked and who are the blessed and the blessed are those who delight in the law of the Lord meditate on it day and night right? they are planted trees planted along the river bank bearing fruit each season trees need water obviously rivers have water plant yourself where you can be nourished right? and keeping your Bible open and giving yourself access to living water is what will keep you nourished and bearing fruit in each season. But I have three kind of final things of what it what like what does it mean to be the church? Right? And as the new pastor here to shepherd you, like what do I if we can hit these three things, but I think the gates of hell will, will shake at what happens. But the first is be the church that opens the door. Now, Revelation 3.20 says, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And we will share a meal together as friends. The reality of life is that Jesus is standing knocking. Jesus is standing at the door knocking. He does not want to come in and destroy you and condemn you forever. If you open the door, he will come in and share a feast with you as your friend. My challenge to you is that we here are the church that opens the door to Jesus. That when Jesus knocks, we say, yes, come in. And we spend time with Jesus. And we spend time with each other. Secondly, be the church that loves the word of God. I will classify myself as a Bible nerd. Most of the people around me will say the same thing. Life's better that way. Right, 2 Timothy 3.16, like, what is, what good is the Bible? Right, all scripture is inspired by God. It's useful to teach what is true. To make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it, the, the Bible and the scriptures, to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. If we are going to serve and we are going to worship and we are going to love Jesus, we have to love the book that tells us about Jesus. It is one moment and one interaction with Jesus that will change your life forever. And if you love the Word of God, you will be like a tree planted by a riverbank. Right? Love the Word of God and love learning about Jesus. Final thing. The whole point of this entire one sermon, two part sermon that you're getting that be the church that pursues proximity with Christ. Be the Christian that actually wants to be with Jesus. Because it's good. Right, Psalm 73, it's written how good it is to be near God. It is good for creation to be connected to their creator. The whole point, the whole motive, the whole goal of being a disciple is being connected to Jesus. It's hard to claim you're a student when you have no teacher. You can't be a follower without a leader. We can't be Christians and we can't be the church without Christ. Right, be the church that opens the door to Jesus. Be the church that sits and learns with God. And be the church that pursues proximity. Right, my goal as your pastor is to help you move... Whoa. It's to move closer to Christ. If that does not happen... I have failed. Right, we will teach from the word of the Lord. And my goal is to help you take one step closer to Jesus. But it's going to start with this. Right, will you open the door to Jesus? Will you let him in your house? Both the house of your heart, the house of your home. And right, will you sit in the same room as him? Now we can let Jesus in and then just go do everything else in every other room of the house. 
that, but will you sit and just learn from Christ? In this specific instance of Luke chapter 10, will you be like Mary instead of being like Martha? Will you just sit and learn at the feet of Jesus? Will you pray with me this morning? God, I thank you that you enter our house, that you knock on our door, no matter how messy it is, on the inside or the outside. Jesus, that you promise us if we just open the door, all you want to do is just sit to teach us to share a meal with us as friends. God, my prayer is that we are the church that opens the door. That when you come knocking on our lives each and every day, God, we open the door and we just sit with you. That that is what we protect. We protect our time and our proximity in your presence. Because God, we need to be with you as your creation. God, we need to be connected to our creator. And in that, God, we are designed for worship and we just sit and worship you. God, my prayer is that we love the Bible. God, we confess everything that keeps us from reading your word. God, we don't know enough. God, we don't have enough time. God, I don't even know what I'm getting into. I don't even know where to start. God, break down those walls and teach us to love your word, to love your laws and your commands, and just sit with the book that you have inspired and written throughout the course of human history, God, just to tell us about yourself. Give us the space and the courage to just let you tell us who you are as God. God, and in that, we just return, we, we understand that we need you, we need to be close to you, and God, as your disciples, as your followers, as your students, we just sit and we learn and we follow your feet just as a Jewish boy would with his rabbi. God, you are our great teacher and we just sit in faith and learn. God, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our final